Gio and I are here with Lawrence Gellerstedt, aka LG, who is managing director and Atlanta boss at the Foundry Commercial. And well, I'll let him kind of give some details, but in, it, he is part of the team at the Switchyards. And I, you have some fans. I know some folks who really love the Switchyards who work out of there in Atlanta. Sam Shea from Liquid Space talks about switchyards a lot so i'm just getting to know lg for the first time thank you for taking the time to do this letting geo talk you into spending an hour with us yeah thanks for having me geo you want to kick us off yeah i mean i'm excited to have lg on we won't give brandon too much credit but brandon Maderos originally connected us and so we we've, we've had some some great conversations both professionally and personally and so i'm I'm really excited to, to to dive deeper he and i've really never even talked about switch yards but we have talked about his background comes from a pedigree of real estate background and some really unique we work background and now he's doing a bunch of really cool sp- stuff in the space with the the future flex so lg why don't you kind of tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll try and do that as, as briefly. I know everybody else has attention as fans like mine. So in my background, traditional institutional real estate, which I have been running from as much as I can. And so tried not to be in real estate, but, but got into it in 2013. My dad told me if I was going to get into it, don't be a tenant rep. And so I did that because it gave me like a rebellious area to play in. So I joined Coachman and Wakefield, but had to rebel from that too. So I didn't really sit there. I sat at the Atlanta Tech Village, which is a local incubator that was started by David Cummings in 2013. I made a very lucky bet that tech would be cool, that co-working would be cool and impact real estate. And I got really lucky on that bet. And so there's three or four unicorn companies that were born out of ATP. I helped all of them scale real estate uh, across the country and in some cases the world. And I got really, really good at co-working. I was an early believer. It solved a lot of problems for a lot of my clients. You might be yeah, the you know, only early believer on the brokerage side yeah. co-working. Well, again, yeah, <laughs> it, it came more out of my will, my goal to rebel than it did probably being right. I just was the black hat in that in that room. So I got lucky. And then when Adam and a bunch of the WeWork guys came to Atlanta, started asking around about who knew the space. I was big, you know, believer in the space already, really active. I got lucky enough to help them scale. They did all the WeWork deals in Atlanta, a little over 800,000 square feet, I think. And then they hired me after trying to get me to come over for like five years. I kept saying no. And then I went over there and in 20, was that 20 or 2017 and then worked till 2019. So, so was there for two years and ran the Southeastern US. So did about a million and a half square feet with them. In just over two years, launched a couple of markets, doubled the size of some markets until, you know, obviously the growth ran out. And, and then I started my own boutique brokerage firm here in Atlanta called SoundSource, built that over three years, sold that to Foundry in June of last year, and now run the Atlanta office for Foundry Commercial. And so have a lot of exposure to different co-working elements throughout my career. Probably the one that I'm definitely the one that I'm most personally invested in is Switchyards. Lucky enough to know Michael early on, who's one of the founders, as well as Brooks. Both had been previous founders at previous tech companies. I was a founding member at Switchyards in the first 500 for their co-working in Atlanta, which is the background of Geo's space right there is his screen. And those guys tried sort of traditional co-working, competing events, didn't work, tried three or four other things and have really hit lightning in a bottle on, on what they have right now. So they, they basically have evolved to a private coffee shop model is what we call it. They're relatively small space is they're not manned with any, any staff. We do have people come through and clean with a pure membership model. So from a revenue perspective, it's a planet fitness model rather than uh, co-working model, so pure members. And then the membership, the community really manages itself. They've got a Slack channel. Um, they make most of the rules. There's some basic rules. They make most of the rules. Uh, it's been uh, really cool to see it grow. So we have 10 in Atlanta. We've got three, I think right now, maybe about to announce a fourth in Nashville. We've got two signed in Charlotte and another one right behind that. And then we'll keep keep growing. So the the idea was last year to see if we could take it out of Georgia. And when we launched, we decided we were going to do that in June. We were able to launch our first location, open the doors and start serving members in September. That gives you any sense of speed. Um, that's pretty wild speed in the co-working world. And we sold 800 memberships in eight minutes. 
in a market that we had never been in. And so we were full top revenue, 100% revenue goal the minute that we sent the email and before the doors opened. So when you think about some of the things that people talk about in flex and co-working, there is some stuff here that doesn't exist anywhere, haven't seen it anywhere. And so, you know, we could, well, I'm sure we'll get in more detail, but the, the switch charge thing has really taken off and a lot of credit to Brooks and Michael on, you know, using startup past experience and failures and things to, to retool again and again and figure it out. And they have a model of keep it simple, which you'll hear a bunch of answers, I'm sure, to questions that are in this that are really about simplicity, not complicating things. And, and so it's a really, really cool story. I'm happy for those guys. Okay, so wait, just to clarify, your role, you're on the real estate team at Switchyard? That's right, yes. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, a, I'm an early investor. I've invested in it multiple times along the way. When I was doing Source and the market was really going against the office, I was like, man, if I just, I love these guys, I'm going to keep investing in it. And worst case scenario, it'll be a hedge against the office. In worst case, I was right. The office has been a pretty tough world, but these guys have gotten some right. And so it's been great. And they've been kind enough to... Uh, let us you know, advise them as they grow across the across the country. So we've helped them at Foundry. I've helped them, you know, open in in Charlotte and continue to grow in Atlanta. And and we're going to the suburbs of Atlanta this year. So we've got some stuff on on tap for that. And then we're we're growing in Nashville. Well, I want to go back to your WeWork background because that's what kind of led and catapulted into all this, right? You've got an incredible yeah. pedigree there. But what was your experience at WeWork that kind of got you to the point where you you really dove completely into the future of Flex and how things were different. And that's really what your brokerage service-based platform was about, right? So you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, for sure. You know, like, uh, like I said, I mean, it, 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 the Atlanta Tech Village, I was an early believer. So I've always really it started from tenant demand, right? I, which I think is the most important perspective to always come from. I think in real estate, we have a tendency to overcompensate with stuff like, you know, I, you, we look at IRR and all this other stuff and you're like, okay, that's great. But all that comes from, is there demand and the tenants really need flex. So this is not going to be a lightning rod issue for the people that listen to this, but, but really that, that drove me to, to WeWork. And, and then at WeWork, I was able to see one, you know, some of the magical stuff that doesn't get covered in the documentaries. Um, the, the teams there were super diverse. It brought together, it brought people into real estate that never would have been in real estate before. It required tech support in a way that real estate hadn't before. And so you had technology people, software people, operations people coming to the table, hospitality people that had never really had interest because there hadn't been a big enough role. And so one of the things that I really value from WeWork is just, I got to see a bunch of really, really smart people from a diverse set of backgrounds attack a problem that I've seen attacked in the same way over and over and over and over again. And so I think that, you know, that got a lot of people scoffing from outside, but I think from inside, it was like one of those things where you're like, man, real estate is such a big asset class. There's so much going on. The, the opportunity for disruption is massive. It's really hard, but it's massive. And so at WeWork, I really got to see that on steroids as they were, you know, fortunate enough and maybe in some ways more fortunate than they should have been in terms of being able to raise money. And that allowed them to do some things that were crazy. And some of that stuff was brilliant and some of it wasn't. But, but I benefited certainly from being around people that were way too smart to have been in real estate that allowed me to see new things that I wouldn't have been able to see before, including people like Brandon and Kevin. I don't want to say Brandon because he already knows that and that's tough, but, but <laughs> Kevin's too. That's funny. Yeah. And it's, so, I mean, I think that's a really unique part that allowed for you to really step into the role that you, you built your brokerage and service-based platform on, right? Because, I mean, I know that you were really committed. You knew exactly what you wanted and you really committed to it, right? I mean, people tried pulling you out of Atlanta to do stuff and you were really committed to Atlanta and Georgia and just doing the best that you could in those markets specifically that surrounded Atlanta. Yeah, totally. I mean, the, the South source model was very much meant to acknowledge sort of what has gone on in the, in the brokerage landscape and, and for years, right? So, you know, the institutional players dominate the market. Um, institutional capital has the biggest deals. The biggest deals have the biggest fees. And so when you look at it, there's the big three of brokerage firms and then there's everybody else. And my viewpoint was, you know, you're never going to out institutional, the institutional guys. But there's room on the other side. So if you can go more creative than them, more entrepreneurial than them, more casual than them, 
which fits my, my rebellious mold. And, you know, there's a lot of room out to that side. And so, you know, I started SouthSource March 1st of 2020. The only revenue streams we had were office leasing. And so I've seen it all now. I think I've, I've, I've worked for founders of billion dollar companies and they're still some of my best friends. And I get to tell them that my startup story is just as hard as theirs. You know, I, 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 I tried to sell something in the worst time in human history to sell that. So anyway, it, it, it I learned a lot on that front and, and yeah, we built sort of a rebellious platform. We focused on neighborhood development. We focused on neighborhood demand. You know, while that was really difficult and certainly not the, I don't want people to hear the story and think, oh, LG, he's so smart and that worked out. It was really hard. It was a really hard time to do what we did. And it didn't, you know, lead to massive amounts of money, but it did lead to us being able to stabilize a business and create something compelling enough for Foundry to come along and want to buy it. You know, and, and it was a hard decision even then to, to sell that company and move into a, a platform like Foundry, which does compete on some more institutional things. And, and the, you know, the vision with, with Foundry was they wanted to be more creative and more edgy, and they wanted to get into some spaces that were more neighborhood focused. And we quite frankly needed to be more institutional. We needed to be able to address bigger problems. I think this is the time, the most massive time of change in office, maybe that'll ever exist. I mean, we have an opportunity to rewrite how office works completely. And quite frankly, given the demand, we, we have the opportunity to do it because stuff's going to get reset at a terrible basis. And so there's going to be this massive opportunity to have a role to play in the future of office. And quite frankly, the decision that then sort of pushed me over the edge outside of all the great people at Foundry was just the ability to play in that space and play a role at a bigger scale than just in Atlanta was too exciting to miss. And so that's really what I wanted it out of Foundry was to be able to take the perspective that we have and all the change that we're seeing and, and be able to be a part of that change on a, at least on a Sunbelt, Southeast United States level. So what was the coolest project you worked on while, while you were with, or just in general, right? But certainly as a broker slash advisor. Sure. Given the timing of this, I'm going to be, there's no chance. I would love to tell some different, like older stories. There's probably some funnier ones, but, but to bring this all the way back, I mean, I, I sat at the Atlanta Tech Village in 2013 when there were picnic tables in the Atlanta Business Chronicle, cubicles and cloth and, you know drop ceiling, we're still downstairs. And I got to know David Cummings really, really well. His right-hand person, one of his right-hand people at Atlanta Ventures is John Birdsong, who's been a friend of mine for a long time. He's going to be a mayor of Atlanta one day, so you can write that down and bet on it. It'd be a great futures bet in Vegas. But he's been a friend of mine since even before David, when I told him that I thought tech you know, and real estate and all that would come together and really have an impact. He was the first person that I, that I really talked to And he's the reason I got connected to David and all this other stuff. We've been friends for, for over a decade now, worked on some political campaigns together and all that sort of comes to a head. And I come to Foundry. The reason I came to Foundry is so that I could do bigger projects, impactful projects. And I get called to, to be a part of helping them evaluate whether they want to buy South Downtown in Atlanta, which is 10 city blocks of the city of Atlanta. Not many opportunities to buy that much real estate in a market as big and high growth and compelling as Atlanta. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to advise them at the end of last year on buying, you know, 53 buildings, most of them historic 10 city blocks in the center of downtown Atlanta. And they're going to remake that into, you know, a, a tech ecosystem that's also a part of the historic neighborhood, an art scene, a music scene, a retail hub. I mean, they, the, the amount of things that they've done, even in, since owning it in December in the last three or four months have been amazing. When they have no rules, they've got a 20 year old period. It's purely a passion project for David. And it comes all the way back to co-working. It'll be where they've already got an Atlanta tech village pop up down there, and they're going to launch two more spaces that'll be. ATV Souths, and it'll be really cool to see what they do. But yeah, now instead of creating sort of co-working on a, you know, single location basis, we're now doing it in an entire neighborhood. So that probably has to be the coolest story and, and ties into co-working pretty well. Yeah. I think one of the things I love about you most, right? We haven't spent a whole lot of time together, but it's quickly to, e it's quite easy to figure out how passionate you are, right? Passionate about what you like, what you don't like, and you're not afraid to be bold about it, right? And you're not afraid to, to take a stand. And and I think that we live in this culture right now that's, it, or it has been taboo to talk about certain things, right? And I think that's where you and I connected after after I read your article in CoStar and 
and everything else. I mean, so, you know, mental health is something that you've been through and people don't understand it. Those of us that are really, really passionate, there's a dark side to it, right? There's a reason why we're passionate yeah, a lot of times. No and I know your dad came out, what, in 2002 with an article that talked about his mental health struggles. Yeah. Then, you know, 20 years later, you followed up with your own. You kind of want to talk about kind of what that journey's been, sure. why you decided to come out about it, because it's huge. Yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah, always happy to talk about that topic. Yeah, me for me, my my dad was a was a my grandfather before him. But they're they're really you know, big time parts of the Atlanta real estate scene and skyline in a lot of ways. And so you know, it was a part of my pedigree growing up. And and they were really successful. But in you know, in the early parts of the two thousands, my dad went through a bunch of mental health stuff and. And there were spells of it, right? But but yeah, the the main part, he went away to a mental health hospital and and wrote an article about it because he he felt like it was the right thing to do to be more public about it as a high, you know, profile individual. And he was really, to be honest, written off from a corporate standpoint in Atlanta and and got lucky enough to come back and be a part of a group called the Integral Group here, which Egbert Perry and him had been friends for a long time. And Egbert got him sort of back in the in the real estate game and, you know. You, you fast forward from there. And again, this is all going to look pretty smooth from the outside and everybody that struggles from this knows it wasn't, but from there to, you know, ends up starting his own company, selling that to cousins, becoming CEO of cousins properties, taking cousins properties from a $500 million diversified REIT to a four and a half billion dollar Sunbelt class A office only. I mean, total redo, right? Yeah. And so, you know, that, that stuff is what the public sees that, you know, he went away once and bounced back. He went away more than that. And it was obviously really difficult. But the, the big thing is not only was he transparent with, with the, you know, Business Chronicle and the Wall Street Journal, but he was transparent with us at home as to what was happening. And that, quite frankly, saved my life. If he hadn't have been that transparent with what was going on with him, I wouldn't have known to look for things in myself. I wouldn't have known that there were things that I was you know, weak to that I, I should, you know, make sure I'm really careful about. And so I was able to recognize things in myself early, uh, learn from some of his mistakes. I made some of those same mistakes, but, but he really helped me, you know, things in a way. And I, and I've been able to sort of find my own, I call it a prescription, but I've been able to find my own prescription on how I treat myself that takes a lot of different things. And I wouldn't have been able to do that without him. And then talking about it publicly, I tell people all the time, this is like, my grandfather had a saying about giving back because we have a big giving back thing in my family that it's civic rent. And so you got to pay your civic rent and that it's really selfish. Because the more you invest in your city and the people around you, the better the city and the people around you are and the better you end up doing. And so it's really this selfish thing. And that for me is how talking about mental health is. Talking about mental health and being honest with other people means I have to be honest with myself. And so it benefits me more than it does anybody else. So people are always like, thank you for doing that. Thank you for saying that, which is great to hear. Anybody who gets that feedback loves that feedback. But for me, I don't do it for you or for whoever's listening. I do it for, because I need to, because if I don't, then I'm not being honest with myself. I'll bury it somewhere. And that's not very helpful. So I'm really doing it out of uh, self-preservation. And that's funny. I tell people I do it. They ask me, why do you do what you do? And I'm like, because I'm selfish, right? And, and yeah. the ability to talk about it actually keeps me honest. And I tell people, you don't start healing until you start telling your story, right? And so yeah. um, if you're not out there actively talking about your struggles, then you really haven't dealt with them, right? And so I think that's the biggest part is everything we go through enables other people uh, to have a blueprint to go through it themselves, right? Just like your dad did for you. Um, and then that's huge. And so thank you for being so open about it. Thank you. I mean, thank you, your yeah. father for setting that, that foundation. And I mean, you came out and the art, I just sent the Jamie, the article in co-star so she can read it, but I mean, that's huge. Yeah. Especially coming a long time ago, a different time. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's also important to normalize it, right? For pe people who haven't started to to sort of deal with it, who suffer from it at any level to know like, okay, other su successful people, like look at your dad's story, you know? And I think I, I listened to this uh, woman who talks all the time about how life is 50, 50 and 50% 50 of life is hard. Like that's just a fact. Right. And I think a lot of yeah. us live in this ideal thinking like, well, the goal is a hundred percent great. You know, yeah. like, and it's just like, even I had to think like, yeah, I guess that is what I expect, like 100% great. And if, you know, you're always working to get to, to better and more great. 
and to know like, yeah, life is hard and, and to have people acknowledge it. I, yeah, I, I think it's super important. I'm curious, you know, you've been, you've been kind of embedded in co-working communities. You know, a lot of folks talk about the mental health benefits of, of those types of spaces and, you know, even just a, a place to, to be. Do you, I mean, what's your view on that? Do you, do you think that's true? Have you experienced that? Do you see that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, listen, it's any, any community building, bond building, relationship building thing is, is typically positive and has a positive impact. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things we talk about all the time, which I'm sure has been talked about on this podcast before is just, you know, at the end of the day, when somebody asks what LG, what gives you confidence in office? What, you know, there's all these bad health, what gives you any confidence? Well, it's that we're human beings, right? So like we still get in the car, we sit in traffic, we, we, you know, pay astronomical amounts to take our wife and sit somewhere else other than the house and eat somebody else's food and listen to somebody else's music and smell somebody else's smoke, right? Like, like we, we do all that and we hope that we sit next to somebody else that we like and we go, you know, to, to work out with people and play golf with it. It just, we're human beings. And at the end of the day, the community stuff matters a ton. And so to take something like office and paint it with a broad brush and say, you know, Nobody wants to work in the same office next to people anymore is just total garbage. And so it's what makes the, the opportunity that we have now in office massively exciting. And I view it as the whole asset class is exciting. I can't wait to, to start making some bets in that space. And that the time for that is the next nine, 12 months. But, but certainly in co-working, it trickles all the way down to if you're trying to make office accessible to everyone, right? Co-working solutions, flex solutions. Are, are for some people, they don't have another option, especially for a switch yards member that's $100 a month to go someplace and have coffee and be able to Slack channel people and meet new people. I mean, that is, for most part, these co-working memberships are way more expensive than that. Their, their focus is on corporate users and should be not, not knocking that business model. Um, but the neighborhood work solution, typically when we're doing switch yards, we're bringing workspaces to places that are yeah, not super accessible. And while a coffee shop might work, that's a very different vibe, right? You don't know who's going to walk in one day versus the next day. And you don't know that you're going to be able to get a seat or, you know, whatever. And the, the membership in a switch charge or something like that matters a lot. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's democratizing in some way access to, which is, which is always a good thing. What's the, I'm going to dive into the model for a minute here. I'll let Gio. Yeah. What, what's the typical floor plate? How many square feet for a switch yard location? Yeah, good question. I mean, we've, we've played with that. So I would say that, you know, it, it might vary. Let me say that the, the main blueprint that we have right now is, is infill Atlanta, right? So we're talking about a big city and we're talking about a, a city that has as many neighborhoods as a Southeastern city that exists, right? So, so in Atlanta, we've got a ton of islands. So from that perspective, it's a very unique city to tackle first. And our experience has been different. I would say we're looking there probably two to 4,000 square feet. They're relatively small yeah, and they're relatively simple. It's got a break area. It's got, it's got bathrooms or access to bathrooms. Ideally, we have one room that would be like either a conference or quiet space. We've got some phone booths and then that's about it. It's wide open. Most, almost 85 and a half percent of the stuff that's in there is just F, F and E. Really cool F, F, and E. It feels really full. Brandon Hintman, who's the creative designer in there, is like one of the most brilliant people that I know. He's, he sources all the furniture. And I mean, you go in there and there's like, yeah, antique, you know, football helmets and, you know, randomly a, a shack, like basketball shit. I mean, just like, but it's full. I mean, it's full to the brand, which makes yeah. him feel really like, I don't know, really at home and special. And so, yeah, yeah it's, it's two to 4,000 feet. But the beauty of it is, I mean, we, we have them within two miles of each other. Yeah. And they still kill it. And so I will say, as we've gone on, looked at our expansion plan, you know, we've really looked at, as we launch new markets, trying to do a flagship. So trying to, as we introduce a new market, we want to be able to host a lot more members. We want to be able to make an impact on day one. Uh, cool spaces are hard to find. Uh, we, we call them needles. And I can talk more about sort of needles in the haystack, but we call them a needle. The way that our demand works, the demand is so, the demand is everywhere, almost everywhere there's rooftops. So we don't, instead of picking here are the top three neighborhoods, which what we work with do is say, this is the best neighborhood. Yeah. I want to start there. We say, what are the nine to 10 best neighborhoods? And then what's the best space? And we're going to start at the best space and then back our way into the neighborhoods. 
which is a really unique way to do it. But, but really like our goal is like, is the space compelling and, and, and the space being compelling for us again, it's like neighborhoods, they can be really different. We've got a two-story one. We've got some single story. We've got some stuff that's, you know, in the back alley. I mean, like our stuff can be anywhere. And so it, it's really, it's been fascinating and fun to work on because we've been able to find a bunch of different solutions. But I would say the flagship locations new to markets more like six to 8,000 feet. There's a chance that we would play with bigger potentially as we keep going down the road. And then, you know, in our Northern suburb in Atlanta, anybody that knows Atlanta, it's like a, you got 285 and 80 and 70, you got it. Uh, 285 going in a circle and 400 straight up. It's like a, a watch. The northern arc of the city is where most of the, the dense residential is, and especially the suburban residential. So we'll be tackling most of that northern arc. And that, you know, I think we'll probably space those out a little more and probably do four to 6,000 feet instead of two to three. Mm-hmm. From, all, a, from an ownership. Still open space. Mostly open, open, yeah. No, we're not. No, we don't sell individual offices yeah. um, for for a multitude of reasons. So again, Brooks and those guys are brilliant when it comes to operations. Obviously, if you can figure out a way to have a co working space operate twenty four seven without anybody there, without so they're problems, on yeah, it's. I mean, it's amazing. But you have to keep yeah. it so simple. And one of the ways that we do that is we don't we don't have companies. We don't want a company. The yep. company would come in and complicate things with certain yep. needs and special requests. Sure, of course, um, yeah. But we don't, we don't do that. So it's, it's just individual memberships. Again, keeps it really simple. Yep. Okay. So next personal question. You mentioned <laughs> wives earlier and I've seen oh, some yeah. of your wedding pictures, by the way, incredible backdrop. So yeah. you, you want to talk yeah. about your, your home life and what you're passionate about at home? Oh goodness. Yeah. That's pretty easy right now. Yes. Yeah, so I had a kid when I was 23 years old, right out of college. So I have a 16 year old son which is awesome. And, and he and I share a love of baseball that has evolved over the years. And probably the most special thing is he's still playing. He's playing really elite travel and high school baseball, which is amazing. And, and uh, yeah, last night I went to one of his games in Hiram, Georgia, way out in the middle of nowhere. And I stopped at the CarMax and Lithia Springs and I picked up his car. And so I took that and I gave him his first car last night, which is a wild experience to hand the keys to your your kid and and to see that so yeah I'm, and now i have to deal with the fact that the only time i get with him is in the car um, and i'm about to lose that too and so yeah a lot of emotions for me right now around my oldest son calvin he's he's the best and yeah so i, I get to spend a lot of time with him around the baseball field and that that time keeps me somewhat away from my three and one year old who i have with my wife jesse who's a saint and so she she teaches special ed she's a public school teacher so we always joke that she gets to do the same thing at home and at work dealing with me. And uh, yeah, we have two little babies together, Smith and, and Fox. Smith's little bar is where I met my wife, a diet bar here in Atlanta. And so we named him Smith. And then Fox is her favorite place in Atlanta, the Fox Theater, where she, she and her grandmother used to go all the time. She's a big dancer and stuff. So she loves that. So, so yeah, so, so busy at home with babies. And I'm always getting the question on the baseball field. Are you like the uncle or the babysitter or like, what's what you know, my, are the babies yours or the big kid yours? So, so yeah, a lot, a lot going on at home. I used to play golf before I had the babies and before Calvin was really no time for 18, travel ball. 18 calls these days. None of that, none of that now. And, and having my own company at the same time. I mean, we started, I started Southworks the same time we had our first kid and our first baby. And so, doing all this stuff with him and South Source has been a, been a wild ride, but really grateful now. Calvin's off, off to the races in a good spot. The South Source thing, the Foundry was awesome and Foundry's been great. And then, yeah, my babies are, I got one potty trained, which is I awesome. So it's potty nice trained. Job. So yeah. yeah, so we're, we're on the, we're, we're still at the peak of the pressure point with kids, but, but with him, Calvin learning how to drive and going off God to college, which terrifies me. And the, the kids getting potty trained, we're on hopefully the downhill part of the the pressure at home. And then obviously works just easy. It's fine. So there, there's something so unique about teachers, period, but teachers that do special ed, right? And so, you know, I joke around, I mean, say, same as you, you and I have so much in common. I'm like, well, that's what allows people to be patient with us, right? Yeah. What, what are the 
the traits or the gifts that, that Jesse has that allows for her to mm. juggle what she does at work, what she does to juggle with you and now the kids, right? Man. Uh, God. Um, great question. Yeah. I mean, the, the number one, you know, there's so many, but, but the number one is patience. I mean, she's so patient with me, understanding with me, with Calvin, who's not her kid, anybody that's done step, step parent stuff knows how tough that is. I can't tell you, you know, Growing up into my twenties, having a kid, I can't tell you how many people that I, I dated or talked to that, you know, would never have taken that on, did not want to take that on and no fault to them is a hard thing to do. And she stepped up into that. And, and so patience would be number one communication. We, she and I talk about communication all the time. One of the, you can call it a benefit. Most days it's a benefit of having a, a father go through mental health stuff and yourself go through mental health stuff as you get enough therapy to where I'm a pretty elite communicator. I'm going to give you as much communication as you could possibly want. And I'm probably really good at it. So my, my wife sometimes calls me a communication ninja because she'll be like, sort of ninja me there. Sort of pick me in a, I'll be like, sorry, sorry. So anyway, I think, I think our communication is elite. That's a, that's a must in any long-term relationship. I'm, I'm super honest about who I am, good and bad. And she's the same. And we give each other a lot of room for that. Um, but we also went in knowing a bunch of stuff. You know, what our, her template is, what my template is, those templates are different. We, we operate mm -hmm. differently. And so we just communicate a lot. And then lastly, that, that would be for any special ed teacher and probably the one that it would be, God, hopefully we don't have enough time. It would be the hardest for me to talk about long-term is selflessness. Like see, given all the stuff that I told you, Gio, you probably feel the same way. Me handling my own mental health is a burden and creates a person that has limitations. So I have a built-in limitation just things I can and cannot do. One of those main limitations is that I have to work to be happy. I'm super anxious about work. Work is really important. I'm always going to want to work. Now that you gave me you know, the lottery, I think in Atlanta right now is over $900 million. If you gave that to me, I would be at work the next day. I have to work. It's just built. It's not healthy all the time, but it is who I am. And then my son, the promise that I made when my son was born, my 16 year old, was that he would sit in the front seat in my life all the time and I'll do anything for him. And you know, for, for somebody like Jesse, who's anybody coming into your life to say, Hey, I've got somebody in the front seat is tough. And, and she has honored that in a way that I didn't even, even though I knew she would, I didn't know it was possible. So, um, selflessness, she puts other people before herself, which is the only way you can do, you know, she's, I think she's in 11 years of, of public school teaching here in Atlanta, all special ed. So it's the only way you can manage that. Yeah. And I think one of the things you said that, that makes you so unique and and those of us that that have the struggle we do is we're overly brutally honest right and jamie will tell you that all right we've had some great conversations and so it's funny i've dated people where they're like i love how transparent you are and then six months in the relationship we're like can you not be so transparent and i'm like wait a minute i don't know the difference Kip, right I do you do you not do you not have to share everything all the time my yeah, wife has yeah. said that to me so many times where she's like you know i'll say something well i really didn't like that dinner i really didn't like this or i can't go to this thing on thursday i don't want to at all and she'd be like, can you just not say it? I know you don't want to go. And I'll be like, I'm going to go with you. I will go. Yes, I'll go. I'm going to tell you the whole time that I don't want to be there. And she, she'll, she'll tell me over and over again. I wish you just, you just didn't have to say it. And I tell I, people, I look, I'm not, our, I'm not smart enough to know the difference of the gray area. I'm black and white, right? The gray area is so different and I'm, I'm getting better about it. But again, kind of, kind of going back to the professional side, it's what allows for us to build the relationships we get to build, right? And have yeah. the the friendships that we get to build on a professional side. Is that kind of your your experience too, as you build relationships and transparency? Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I would talk about this to anybody that'll listen. I think it's another one of the limitations that I tell people I have is it, with with the struggles that I have is being me is exhausting and trying to be somebody else. I don't have the capability to do it. If I did it, I would end up in a bad place. And, and quite frankly, the brokerage business, and I, and I have a little group that gets together here in Atlanta and talks about this sometimes. I mean, the brokerage business is a brutal business to struggle with what we have because your, your goal is to be an outward persona. Your goal is to get on a podcast and share your feelings and do this stuff. And, and there are days and times where you just can't do that or you can't do it authentically without being honest. And so I find that authenticity has driven me into really unique places. It's quite frankly, what made me appealing to the guys that we work. It's what you know allows me to maintain a strong relationship with the clients that I do have. And a hundred percent, there are people out there that would never work with me because I'm not polished enough and I'm not going to say the right thing. And if you take me to the wrong, you know, cocktail party, I'll say the wrong. I mean, 
it just, there's a hundred percent chance that there are people, especially in, in our business in the Southeast, you know, I'm not polished enough for some of that. And, and I could be, man, I grew up in it. That's the thing is I know, but I got Roman numerals. I got all that stuff. I could do it, but I wouldn't be happy and I wouldn't be healthy. And so I, I can't, I, I don't have the option to do it, even if I wanted. Jamie, I'm hoarding, I'm, I'm hoarding time. I know. I like it. I love it. Gio asks the best questions, especially when he, you know, he, he, he understands our, our yeah. guest and what they can bring to the table. He's got a special gift for that. Nailing it. Totally. Okay. Well, I'm going to go back to the, you, you're, you're betting on office still. Tell me, what do you, what are we going to see? Okay. And then Atlanta is kind of a unique market. I mean, I remember, you know, post COVID, like Atlanta was like, hell yeah, we're going back. You know, we'd look at the, you know, the yeah. infographics or whatever, and it's like Atlanta's going back. Yeah. What's your, what, what's your, what are your predictions or your outlook on, on office? Yeah. Listen, I, it, it's not going to be a rush back. I mean, I think, you know, the, the crazy part of this business, I mean, I think we've lost 20 to 30% of the overall demand. And I think we've probably lost that. We could say permanently, but I, for real estate, really the cycle that we're in is the only one that matters. We've lost it for this cycle. That's probably yeah. an eight to 10 year cycle that we've lost it for, which means there's way too much space. And then if you take that and compound that with the, the 60 to 70% of demand that remains has changed, what they want, what they need, how they work has changed for most people. Then you're really talking about sort of 50 to 60% of the space that exists today probably doesn't work. How do you handle that? How do cities take that tax hit? How does that all get distributed? I mean, there's so much left to figure out. But again, I go back to the fact that we're human beings. We have to occupy space. There's a lot of creative ways to use that space. I don't think residential to, to office conversion is some thing that's going to come and save us. I don't think data center is going to come and save us. I've heard some really awesome ideas about urban agriculture and growing fruit. I mean, yep. like there's everybody's coming up with these things. Self-storage. I mean. Y'all have heard, I mean, the, we're going to grow weed and sports bet in every single one of them. Yeah. Because um, maybe that, those are the two things in the highest demand right now is we could, we can sports bet and, and, and grow fruit and, and, and grow weed. So I think that stuff, you know, all that stuff will combine foundry, you know, to their credit, one of the things that attracted me to the platform and not to wave the, the orange flag too high, but, but I, but I am drinking the Kool-Aid, you know, they have a development and investment business. I've always been at big, a big shop at Cushman where, you know, that stuff wasn't really connected to us. So being able to be here and, and look at deals and move fast based on demand, we've got three projects underway right now that are tearing down office and building industrial. It's not going to work in a lot of places, really niche uses, but yeah, you know, there's things like that that are going to happen. So I think there's a lot of solutions coming for the supply side. It's going to take 10 years to run that all out of the cycle. But at the end of that 10 years, office will still be an investment class. People will still get together and work. You know, all that stuff will will still be a part of it. Companies will still lease office space. I do believe it will look, I believe the advisory part of that will look a lot more like EY. I believe it'll look a lot more salary and bonus and data and technology. I think that stuff, especially for the big firms that service big corporate users. Um, but but then the, the office space itself is going to look a lot more. I think we talked about, you know, I know, I remember telling people when I was at WeWork that Flex is going to be. 20% of a market and then freaked out. I mean, flex now, 30% of a market. You know, I, I think I think flex becomes, you know, more evolved and broken down into different classes. So you'll have the switch yards, the private coffee shop model. You'll have the stuff that's private office. You'll have the spec suites and managed spec suites. And you'll have even more conferencing and all that kind of stuff. All that will be managed. I mean, I think where I always point people to is hotels. Brandon's been using the hotel. Yeah. I, I'd love to take his data point and say that, you know, the risk spread between hotel and office has been 150 basis points forever. You, know, you can use that to to have daily cash flow, nightly cash flow, and it's still, you know, that argument. And, th and that will be what it is. You'll have places like downtown Roswell and Atlanta or whatever that sort of cool, su like suburban node that's kind of far out from CBD. Those places may only have, you know, switch yards and a little bit of private office. You get to a diversified CBD right in the middle of Atlanta, that's going to have every option, right? It, just like the hotels, it'll scale from Intercontinental Hotel to Hilton Garden Inn. And there'll be operators out there to do that stuff. But all that stuff has to get sorted through with the capital markets. And that's, and that's a challenge. I mean, the, the management. I mean, that's a huge benefit a to the switch yard. Model. The switch yard model is benefiting a lot. I mean, yeah. 
A lot. We're out there. We're so we're out there doing low capex right. leases, right? Yeah. So like, if you tell a landlord, "Hey, I'm going to bring some energy to your space. You don't yep. need to put it on the PI, and yep. you get a lease." I mean, right. that again, it's a really unique way they've built that widget, but it's solving a lot of problems. And I just think, you know, in my mind, Brandon's been saying it for forever too. But I mean, in my mind, long term, the bigger co working stuff. The North Star that was never aligned to with the lease model and certainly isn't with the management agreement model is you have to align to building value. How do you incentivize all groups to maximize the value of the asset? And so it gets into probably more complicated JV type structures. Uh, but the the management agreement model, yeah, doesn't work in my opinion. There's not enough incentive and it's a bad business. I quite frankly don't know why you'd want to be in the management business. Um just, just tough incentive alignment. And then, you know, I, I think the lease model had a, a bunch of flaws. Management agreement. Agreement. I mean, to your point, a strict management, yeah. like when you get into the JV level. Then- yes, pure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in my mind, if you're, you need to be aligning to the North Star, which is everybody should be trying to make the asset as valuable as possible and everybody should be rewarded for that. And that, that's, that's really what agree. needs to be figured out long. Yeah. Can I put a vote in for Chicago for your next switchyards market? You can, I, the, honestly, the challenge with Chicago is, is like, we looked at Atlanta and how hard it's been to tackle Atlanta and how long it's taken. And you're like, man, there's so many places you could do 20 of these in Chicago. So I, I love Chicago for three months out of the year, like most people. Yeah, and then, you know, for the rest of the I know, but it has else. lots of, I, I, live there, I mean, I live in the Bay Area now and I, but I lived in Chicago yeah. for 15 years. And there's just so many different neighborhoods that could just see. So them. many neighborhoods. If you can find your needle. Be, and I think there's some good needles in Chicago. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We're going to have, we're going to have some good problems to figure out. There's some, some, you know, good stuff on our fundraising side that's happening. So we'll have some more growth ahead and then, yeah, and then we'll see what the next cities are. But I think we've, we've proven that we can do new cities and we're proving the suburbs now in Atlanta. And that will have matched everything. We can do big city, small city, suburbs, and towns. I'll be curious and about the suburbs. Then it's everywhere. I'm a tiny bit skeptical about the suburbs. So I can't. I can't wait to come back to you on that. I can. I mean, again, right now, all I'll say is, if you think about the rooftops that are up there, and think about the lack of actual cool office. Yeah, I, li- I live in a suburb who live up there. Nothing. I mean, and not places okay. to go. And so yeah. the the quite frankly, the, the early indications are that we'll have more demand than we do in town. Yeah, I think the problem is lack of office because I think in the suburbs you've got older professionals who need to make phone calls. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. I think okay. I, it's, we'll, we'll it's been, we'll it's been <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll be able to know. We'll come back. All right, Gia, what you got? You want to wrap up? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, I'd love to just finish it on. I mean, you you're seeing a lot of things out there in the world, not just professionally but personally, right? And that's really what your passion is that makes you successful. If you were to kind of give a last last minute spiel right now on what you advise people to be doing during very difficult political and socioeconomic times, trying financial times, a lot of just lack of consistency out there, what would you say? Man, um, I hate to say it because I used to be way more politically active than I am now, but again, survival kicks in. I would say look down, right? Look, look closer, right around yourself. Break the lens. Global news, na- international news, national news even is tough. It's the further you stay away from that, the better. You know, shrink your news sources to, to stuff that you really trust and, and only look at it in certain times. But I mean, I think, I, I think look down. I've also, I've been on a massive kick recently of reading Trevor Moad's book and, and after Nick Saban's retirement, if any of you know him, he was a, psychologist or sports psychologist that there was at the IMG Academy and then was a part of FSU's national championship and Bama's national championship and a bunch of these things, Russell Wilson. So anyway, I say all that, if you, I've I've been listening to a lot of his, his talks, you know, the idea is that, you know, he's, he's viewing it from a sports perspective, but it's, you know, everything that you want in life is out there. It's just how bad do you want it and what are you willing to do? And, and so the book, Trevor Mudd's book is it takes what it takes. And, and Nick Saban used to stand up in front of every season and hold up a bag of Doritos and an apple. And he would say, you know, you guys think you have a choice, but the guys that go to the NFL, this isn't a choice. There's just one thing to do. It's just how bad do you want it? You eat the apple and you move on. And so for all of us in our lives, 
I look at it as, as, you know, we have to be really honest about what we want and then what are we willing to do and what is it going to take, you know, as somebody who has a, a super successful family and, and I'll never meet that and that's okay. It, there's things that I want at work that I, I, I can't have, I don't want to have. There's, there's things I set my sights on that are like, do I want to be the top broker in Atlanta? Yes. Will I do that? No. Is it because I'm not capable? No, it's just because I'm trading off my dad was gone 80, 90 hours a week. I don't want to be gone that much. You know, I have a fragile mental health you know, capacity. I need to be able to do things that take away from my time to do other things. And so I think it's about setting really, really clear. These are the few things that I really want. What does it take to get them honestly? And how much time are you willing to spend on those things? And then knowing that you've made that commitment so that especially in the brokerage business, your time doesn't get sucked into stuff that's not related to those things. Just say no to all that stuff and know that, yes, it's going to cost you a deal. Yes, it's going to cost you a relationship. Yes, it will have a cost. But you're making the determination, I'm investing in these things for these reasons, and I'm going to get what I want out of it. And there's, and, and there's not infinite. I think the myth today is you can get on social media and you can make millions and millions of dollars from doing nothing and your life will then just be perfect and everything is right there and you don't have to try that. And it's like, no, those people, you know, David Goggins is a great example, most driven athlete in the world. He can do all these things. His family lives has. So like, those are not people to look to, to say they're perfect. Like people, nothing is perfect. It all takes away. If you spend all your time being this elite athlete, it takes away from home. You cannot be perfect. You can't be everything to everyone. And you have to be really honest about what you can do. I'll tell you what I tell people all the time is, and, and, All, every rehab you go to will tell you this, right? Draw a circle around yourself and you can control what's inside the circle and that's it, right? And so, so, so often we're trying to control so many things outside of that and it makes it real difficult. And that's where we put a lot of, you know, friction on our relationships, on our own personal well being. So, but really appreciate you joining us. Thank you for the transparency. Keep doing what you're doing because you, your, your story's changing lives, whether, whether you get to see the fruit of that or not. Right. And so just, just keep being you because it's, it's changed the world. Awesome, man. Well, thank you guys. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Gio. Appreciate y'all.